everyone. My name is Rose Chiachi and I'm the Executive Director of the Pike County Public Library. I'm here to today to tell you how to sign up for a library card. If you're a Pike County resident, it's really easy. You just stop by with proof of residency and a photo ID and we'll get you all signed up. If you're not a resident, it's also really easy. You can just stop by with a photo ID and for $35, you'll have full access to all of the library resources. Unfortunately, right now our buildings aren't open to the public, but you can still sign up for a library card on our website, www.pcpl.org. Whether you're doing research for a project or looking for some inspiration, we can absolutely help you find what you're looking for. A really cool thing about libraries is that if we don't have the item that you're looking for, we can find it for you, no problem. We have a huge network of libraries in Pennsylvania and the entire country that we can borrow from on your behalf. Please check out our website, www.pcpl.org for all of the virtual opportunities we're offering right now, or give us a call with any questions. Finally, I wanna thank everyone from Peters Valley for bringing these great programs to our community and including the library. Thank you and I hope you enjoy the program. Welcome everyone, I'm Kristen Muller, the Executive Director of Peters Valley School of Craft and I am so happy to be here tonight and we thank the Greater Pike County Community Foundation and the Richard L. Snyder Fund for funding this library lecture series in partnership with the Pike County Library. So thank you, Rose. Um, tonight, we welcome Sarah Archer. And Sarah is an award-winning design and culture writer based in Philadelphia. She's the author of The Mid-Century Kitchen, also the author of Mid-Century Christmas, and her newly published book, Catland, The Soft Power of Cat Culture in Japan. She's a contributing editor for American Craft Magazine. Sarah's articles and reviews have appeared in The Atlantic, The Cut, Architectural Digest, The New Yorker Online, Curbed, Metropolis, City Lab, Slate, The Washington Post, The Magazine Antiques, The Journal of Modern Craft, The Studio Potter, among other outlets. We are thrilled to have Sarah with us tonight to talk about the Mid-Century Kitchen. And I know that I've enjoyed a few conversations with Sarah in the past, so we are in for a treat. So welcome, Sarah. Um, I think now you can share your screen to start the presentation. Will do. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Peters Valley team. Um, it's wonderful to be here virtually. Um, let's see, sharing screen and let's go to... You can get us to start. I'm gonna say a couple of things. Welcome everyone who's tuning in tonight. Sarah's gonna start her presentation and we have, um, we love to hear where you're from. You can type in where you're tuning in from in the chat. We'll also be posting information to her website and links to the books um, in the chat. And if you'd like to ask some questions, you can just pop them into the Q&A section that's at the bottom of the screen. Um, just hover over there and you can put your questions in there and we will do our best to get to them at the end of the presentation. <laughs> so thank you. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. So the kitchen of the future. Um, I spend a fair amount of my time um, writing about interiors, writing about design, history, and uh, present. And as you heard from the introduction, kind of a, a range of different kinds of periodicals, some very mainstream, um, some who live sort of in Ikea land like I do, some very, very high end and fancy. And something that I've noticed, particularly when I'm hanging out in the high end, um, writing for Architectural Digest or what have you, is that kitchens nowadays um, in the kind of um, refined to luxurious space don't look mid-century at all. And not only do they not look mid-century at all, they sort of look like they're from Downton Abbey or you know, sort of circa 1910. There's this real powerful trend toward almost gilded age kitchens. Um, plain English is the sort of exemplar of this. And these are absolutely gorgeous. Um, fine woodwork, you know, not a flashing uh, clock glowing uh, to be seen, not a lot of uh, visible technology, lots of very highly visible fine craftsmanship, obviously very expensive paint, um, you know, lots of rustic touches and a lot of sort of the, you know, even brand new houses will have kind of antique beams put in uh, to give their kitchens uh, kind of a farmhouse feel. Um, and having spent a couple of years 
deep in Formica land and kind of deep in the world of plastics and post-war gadgetry and the atomic age, I found this really interesting. And it kind of occurred to me that essentially that what we call the kitchen of the future, by which we mean these sort of fantastic kitchens that appeared at world's fairs in different places in the 1950s and 60s, um, is really an artifact of the past. Which makes me, I don't know, I have mixed feelings about this, as, as we'll discuss. So I love these illustrations from um, a children's book of, of mine um, by John Goodall, who's a British illustrator. Um, the book is called Above and Below Stairs, and it's kind of um, an upstairs, downstairs children's book, which is just very, very British. Um, and they illustrate throughout the ages um, kind of the fine dining uh, lords and ladies upstairs and then the household staff downstairs who would make it run. And so there's the reign of Queen Victoria, there's Edwardian, it goes all the way back to the Middle Ages and it's really darling and cute. And um, one of my favorites is that the last panel, which is today in 1983, which shows this kind of cool bohemian guy with a hot plate, there's no downstairs. To, Mr. Today is kind of living in a studio um, the way sort of 1983 cool people did, I guess, um, you know, in sort, of, in sort of a garret. And there's no downstairs to make the upstairs run. Um, if we look at this through the lens of the 20th century, this idea of sort of the politics of the kitchen usually falls along the fault line of gender. We sort of argue about who does their share of the housework. Um, we debate, you know, who does the cooking, what it means for women's professional development. Um, how, and personal well-being, how much time they're spending. But the fault line prior to the mid-20th century wasn't gender, but class. We're used to thinking of kitchens as a universal kind of room that everyone has, that has certain standard features that you can always expect, um, as essential as a place to sleep or a bathroom. But our great-great-grandparents didn't think that way. The writer Kate Etherington who's an urban planner points out in a fascinating essay about New York City apartment kitchens that one reason many urban apartments today have such strange and logic defying kitchen setups is that they weren't designed with full kitchens in the first place. She writes, newer kitchens were either added on long after the apartment's construction or were originally built to serve multiple purposes. For example, to serve triple duty as a kitchen, bathing area and bedroom. The result is a hodgepodge of kitchen facilities that range from cramped to outrageously dysfunctional. This approach makes sense when you consider that the only fully outfitted kitchens were prior to the 20th century, true workspaces who, where household staff labored in the service of a well-to-do or even middle-class family. Images from photojournalist and activist Jacob Reese's 1890 book, How the Other Half Lives, showed families and boarding house residents in tight quarters that were poorly lit, lacked adequate workspace and running water. At the other end of the spectrum, as Gwendolyn Wright notes in her 1981 History of American Housing during the Gilded Age, there were posh apartment hotels for the wealthy, such as the Grosvenor Apartments on Lower Fifth Avenue, that didn't offer individual kitchens because residents would simply order food to be brought up as though they were staying at the Ritz-Carlton. So for the poor and working class, dwellings generally had no discrete kitchen. In a one or two room house, be it an apartment or a farmhouse, a large cast iron stove was likely to be the only major appliance and might also be the family's primary heat source. A table or a set of shelves might serve to house utensils and tools, but there were no standardized cabinets, no kitchen furniture as we know it today. The idea of a dedicated space to cook, which might also be stylish and even fun to spend time in, was only possible because two major impacts of industrialization. First is mass production, along with municipal gas, water, and electricity, which made modern appliances affordable, and more broadly, it triggered an enormous upheaval that transformed social class in the Western world. In other words, the 20th century kitchen was a new kind of room designed for a new kind of person. But before we get to all these groovy new people, we're gonna go back in time a little bit to talk about home economics. The writer and home economist Catherine Beecher first published her book, A Treatise on Domestic Economy with plans for food storage, workspaces and advice on appliances in 1843. In 1869, Beecher and her sister Harriet Beecher Stowe published an expanded edition of the book called The American Woman's Home or Principles of Domestic Science Being a Guide to the Formation of and Maintenance of Economical, Healthful, Beautiful Christian Homes. Catherine was in favor of education for women, but she was also an anti-suffragist 
believing that women should be, remain uncorrupted by politics so that they could better guide and nurture their families at home. The American Woman's Home Guide is a mid 19th century kitchen planning masterwork. It includes diagrams for built in shelves and cabinets. It recommends separate hygienic workspaces for cooking and cleaning up. It offers information about fireplaces and stoves and provides nutritional information, including a guide to medicinal plants. Its primary focus is technological change. The sisters knew that industrialization in the decades following the Civil War, from new gadgets to new ways of, pro new ways of processing and selling food, were going to totally transform American domestic life. Their book was aimed at helping women navigate these changes. And along the way, they advocated things that sound quite contemporary today, like exercising daily and eating less meat. At the turn of the 20th century, on the heels of unprecedented technological and social change, something profound shifted in the way that gender, work, and the home were collectively understood. Toward the end of the 19th century, water pipes were laid, sewers were built, and gas lines were put down. And by the turn of the 20th century, most major cities, most major cities in the United States had electricity. They also had factories. The foundation of domestic science that had been laid by women like Catherine Beecher and others entered the modern era in 1912 when home economist Christine Frederick conducted a series of experiments applying the theories of scientific management or Taylorism to the kitchen. The mechanical engineer Frederick Winslow Taylor had used time and motion studies to break factory jobs down into their component parts in an effort to identify waste and redundancies. Taylor studied things like the physical movements of workers and the positions of pieces of equipment to relative to supplies and workspaces. In the closing decades of the 19th century, Taylor worked with large companies like Bethlehem Steel as a consultant, eventually developing the field of scientific management. So Christine Frederick studied Taylor's work and applied the logic of Taylorism to the kitchen, which if you think back to sort of the Beecher sisters notion that the politics and business of the outside world should stay outside and you know, women shouldn't work because they need to nurture their families and sort of do that in a pure and secure way. This is a, this is a pretty big shift. She wrote several books, including Meals That Cook Themselves and Cut Costs in 1915, The New Housekeeping, Efficiency Studies and Home Management in 1918, Household Engineering, Scientific Management in the Home in 1923, and her most famous, Selling Mrs. Consumer in 1929. This beautiful image, which kind of looks like a work of art, is actually um, one of Frank and Lillian Gilbreth's motion studies. And the, the woman that you can sort of make out in the photograph is actually wearing light bulbs. And she's doing household tasks being photographed um, at a very slow exposure so that you can kind of see all the wonderful movements of her hands captured in um, this sort of Picasso-like dance of light. Efficiency experts Frank and Lillian Gilbreth were inspired by Taylor as well, but they also critiqued his methods and they felt he undervalued human psychology and his theories of efficiency. Lillian earned her PhD from Brown University in 1915 and became an early pioneer in what's now known as organizational psychology. Her kitchen design was built around something called the work triangle. That's them. They are famous for a book or a movie you've probably heard of called Cheaper by the Dozen. And that was one of the big, uh, impetuses in sort of the drive to become more and more efficient. The work triangle positioned appliances and work surfaces in a triangular configuration, allowing home cooks to pivot from ingredients to worktop to stove to sink with relative ease, saving steps. And Frederick's work also inspired the development of the famed Frankfurt Kitchen, which was designed by Margaret schutt in 1926. She was the very first woman to qualify as an architect in Austria. Schutt Lahotsky was, was tasked with creating an efficient kitchen for a social housing project in Frankfurt, being designed by the architect Ernst May, who sought to meet the urgent need for housing following World War I. She believed that housework was a profession, and though a professional woman in a separate field herself, it deserved, she felt that housework deserved to be treated seriously as such. Presaging the work of American designers Norman Bel Geddes and Raymond Lowy, who drew inspiration from trains and cars in designing their streamlined kitchen appliances of the 30s, Schutlahansky found a model of culinary efficiency in the kitchens of railway dining cars designed by the Metropa Catering Company. Though tiny, the cars served scores of diners using an extremely small galley space, a term that we still use today to describe compact apartment kitchens. 
So after World War I, women had formerly, who had formerly worked in domestic service began pursuing better paying kinds of work, like teaching, nursing, retail, office, and factory labor. As if on cue, manufacturers had just the thing. Appliances that were advertised as in this very glamorous Westinghouse print ad from 1922 as invisible servants. In the 1920s and 30s, modern appliances were sometimes seen to substitute for household staff that families could either no longer afford to hire because of the depression, or they became status symbols for families who had never had help in the first place. In her 1961 book, Mastering the Art of French Cooking, Julia Child would later refer to these people, which is to say the vast majority of humanity, as servantless. The, an idea so novel in the context of gourmet cooking that it needed its own special term. Appliances offered people, especially women, a new way to be servantless, modern and proud. This 1927 ad from General Electric promotes the monitor top refrigerator and our hostess says, one of the first things that made me favor this General Electric refrigerator was the fact that it needs no oiling. All you have to do is plug it in and forget it. Go away for weekends without worrying about it at all. And in one of these beautiful pamphlets that they produced during this period, they contrast the sort of Beecher era kitchen with one of these new ultra glam kitchens, writing the old fashioned kitchen is full of work, crossed and recrossed with countless steps, obviously not employing the work triangle, the scene of hundreds of lost hours loaded with routine drudgery. The result is lost youth and beauty and impaired health. So there's a lot of like partying going on in the kitchen. It, and it, it, you know, if you read these pamphlets and had no other knowledge of life in the 1920s and 30s, you would think that there was just a lot of glamorous activity going on. Um, Come out to the kitchen is the cheery invitation extended at the most informal home gatherings today, they write. The modern mode of living and entertaining demands a kitchen that is attractive and inviting. So what does the future in air quotes look like anyway? Um, this image is the General Motors Futurama display at the 1939 World's Fair, which was designed by the great Norman Bill Geddes. Um, his vision of the world 20 years into the future, which by his lights was 1959, 1960. Um, the installation was sponsored by General Motors, so not surprisingly, it's characterized by automated highways and sprawling suburbs. And by 1930, the results of a series of wind tunnel tests from the 1920s suggested that teardrop shaped forms reduced wind resistance and were being adopted by the aviation industry as well as train and car manufacturers who were fearful of competition from automobiles. So this is one of the refrigerators that would like allow you to go away for the weekend and didn't require oiling. And this was the cold spot, which was designed less than 10 years later um, by Raymond Lowy and adopted the principles of streamlining. Rounded edges, vertical lines, suggesting speed. These are sometimes called speed whiskers. Um, to an appliance that most likely wasn't going anywhere, sort of didn't you know, need to move fast through the air, but the look of streamlining was the look of the future. And the future or novelty itself could be very profitable. Um, there's this notion that among advertisers on Madison Avenue in the 1930s, that what we think of as durable goods needed to be recast as disposable so that things like annual styling would sort of inspire people to kind of say, you know, well, my, my old car is out of fashion, so I need a new one. My old cabinets are out of fashion, so I need a new one. We're very used to that now because we all need to buy a new phone every two years, but back then this was actually a relatively novel idea. And there were lots of examples of household goods that were made more beautiful and more novel through streamlining. Walter Dorwin Teague's Kodak Bantam camera also probably doesn't need to go fast through the air, but there it is. Ken Weber's Zephyr electric clock, Brooke Stevens Toastalator, um, which is just really, really tempting. If they sold the Toastalator today, I would probably buy one. So in the 1930s and early 40s, we have consumer products whose design mirrors the glamorous new machines in the realm of transportation, evoking ideas of speed and science and progress. Um, but we still have gender to think about. Um, as in this very unusual uh, GE ad from the 1930s, which reads, it's easy to stay young when GE appliances do the work. What woman's heart doesn't beat faster at praise from her very own son now come into his dinner coat age. She can tell him anew her secret for fadeless youth. 
she has surrounded the hard and aging household task to general, surrendered the hard and aging household task to general electric appliances. So there is, um, we, we have not escaped from advertising that claims to kind of make women more young, more beautiful, et cetera, et cetera. But you, it's, it's rare to see that in a, in a dishwasher ad nowadays, but this was very, very common in this era. So common in fact that uh, a version of it played out as a kind of um, ersatz boxing match. And this is one of the first little video clips that I'm gonna show you. Um, the entire thing is on YouTube. So if you're really into this, you can find the entire thing. Um, it's called The Middleton Family at the World's Fair. And it was an industrial short produced by Westinghouse in 1939. And here is the exciting conclusion. She's hitting those dishes with everything she has. She's consistently diving in the bottom of the dark and greasy water to search for knives and forks. Dish water splashing around terrific great all over Mrs. Drudge. That rubber apron is much help now. She's splashing so hard it's getting all over me. And it's a little dangerous attempt to give a blow by blow account of what's going on in that dishpan. There's a lot of action over here. She's mopping up with a towel to get the water. Some of the dishes she dried a few minutes ago. That water in the pan is an awful messy looking side, folks. I wish you could see it. Incidentally, in the entire operation, the dishwasher would use a total of only 15 quarts of water, which is a lot less than Mrs. Drudge's use. And over here, Mrs. Yeah, Drudge. Dishes just like Charles. Now, water's not coming out. I remember, folks. He came anomaly. Washed the whole thing. He heated dishes. Then he used water. That's why I never got a milk anymore. Yeah, Mrs. Drudge, come on. Now I know he's swallowed. Now I know he's swallowed. Mrs. Drudge, come on, please. Hurry, Mrs. Drudge, before it's too late. That water's coming out very fast. Too late. There's the last stop of water, folks. The contest is over in exactly seven minutes and fifty-eight seconds. In that time, Mrs. Martin has washed fifty dishes and forty pieces of silverware. As I. Well, it's all over, Mrs. Drudge. You may as well rest now. <laughs> as I said before, ladies and gentlemen, this contest is going to be scored on three counts. First, the time it takes to do the dishes. Unquestionably, Mrs. Modern wins on that score. Second, the cleanliness of the dishes. They are clean, they are dry, and sparkling. They are to honor to any woman's table, so Mrs. Modern wins point number two. Her dishes are certainly cleaner. And now, point number three the condition of the contestants. Mrs. Modern looks as fresh and neat as when she stepped into the ring. While Mrs. Drudge, well, I have to leave that to you. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I give you the winner, Mrs. Modern. So I, I feel very protective of Mrs. Drudge because I think she's, she's given a very hard time. Um, Hitting those stations. Oop, there we go. Um, it, such a kind of grotesque emphasis on, you know, this poor woman's physical traits and her condition, obviously it was all, you know, sort of for the cameras, but um, this idea that your attractiveness as a woman and your attractiveness to your husband was kind of bound up in, uh, you know, having these household devices to spare you from this aging drudgery. Um, and of course, then in, in the early 1940s, like this spread from Better Homes and Gardens, um, the United States is at war and purchases um, are on hold. Nobody is buying anything. A lot of companies are um, have sort of given over their production capacity to the war effort um, because the industrial, the military industrial complex didn't really exist yet formally the way it does now. Um, so this selection of futuristic kitchen design is actually all made with glass because we're still in the early forties now. So we're not really looking at plastic yet. Um, and it promised, you know, a kind of high tech, very cool looking actually, um, showcase of all the things that glass can do. Libby Owens Ford was a glass company. So they were kind of trying to, to find ways to show off how modern and, and innovative it was. And lots of neat things like a, a pedal that would turn the faucet on and um, a kind of built-in waffle maker, which to me looks like it would just always be full of crumbs and that would drive me crazy, but it, it is kind of cool looking. Um, and this was even kind of made fun of. This is a um, cartoon based on the idea of a kind of almost war plane in the kitchen that would sort of fire water at objects to clean them. And it was designed by somebody who worked in an advertising company somewhere in the Midwest anonymously. We still don't know who it is. And by 1945, um, it was time to plan. And companies like Hot Point were advertising um, sort of new fitted kitchens that were color coordinated and had all the latest conveniences. Um, and Americans really responded to this. Um, the government engineered home ownership, um, of course, primarily for Americans who are white um, because of redlining, um, African-Americans were largely locked out of this system. So we refer to it as the post-war boom, but it's important to remember that it was the post-war boom, um, not for everyone. Um, 
Nevertheless, a huge increase in Americans owning their own homes leapt you know, by 20%, um, hundreds of thousands of new homes built, and a lot of them were prefab. So there is a, a distinct look and feel um, to many of these homes. Uh, and William Levitt, who famously developed Levittown, um, was keenly aware of the political power of this. There was a huge emphasis on domesticity and home buying and home building. He famously wrote, no man who owns his own house and lot can be a communist, he has too much to do. And here are some of the, the options that were available. So this is an article from Popular Science Magazine about the Cornell Kitchen which was the product of a research project at Cornell University uh, where experts in home economics, engineering, architecture, and psychology all got together to try to develop um, the perfect modern kitchen. Um, and like Christine Frederick 30 years earlier, the goal was to apply the best insights of science to make kitchens better. And of course it never, it goes without saying that this is being de designed for women because women belong here. Um, that's never uh, questioned. So doing so would subtly or not so subtly emphasize, emphasize the idea that women belong there. The industrial designer Henry Dreyfus wrote several books, Designing for the People in 1955 and The Measure of a Man in 1960, both of which presented case studies and design principles of a field called anthropometrics, uh, literally the measure of a man. The idea was that products should be designed to be proportional. Since women are generally shorter on average than men, designers and manufacturers settled on a height range anywhere from about five foot four to five foot six as the standard against which products like appliances should be designed. The post-war kitchen was also full of material novelties. Earl Tuppers invented, invented his eponymous plastic containers made from polyethylene, a plastic developed for insulating electrical wiring in wartime devices. In 1949, Earl Tupper wrote, with the end of the war, polyethylene was like another young veteran who had accelerated from childhood to a fighting job and done its job well, but like all young vets returning from the wars had never had civilian adult experience. In other words, plastic had not really been tested on, on sort of in the general public and now it was time to unleash plastic on the American public. Tupper joined forces with a marketing wizard named Brownie Wise who devised the concept of Tupperware parties which introduced women to the product, allowed them to see it in action and get used to it, used to its plasticky texture and smell, uh, both of which were alien to people in the 1940s. So what did progress look like in the 1940s and early 50s? Not streamlining. Um, and in fact, one of the big drivers in, of innovation had to be interpreted almost artistically by designers because nuclear energy is something that we can't see. So lots of designers were kind of, gravitating to this dynamic, atomic, um, you know, these wonderful designs. This is Eva Zeisel's fantasy pattern teacup for Hall China, um, the famous ball clock, which is uh, sometimes called the atomic clock by George Nelson, um, which resembles sort of models of the atom that you might see in a classroom, um, the famous Sputnik chandelier in the early 60s, and of course the real thing. Sputnik 1 was launched from the Beinecker Cosmodrome on October 4th, 1957, and it triggered a big wave of anxiety across the United States government because it had really caught everybody off guard, really by surprise. What does the space race have to do with kitchens exactly though? Well, World's Fairs and international exhibitions were places for propaganda theater to play out. Um, the American National Exhibition in Sokolniki Park, Moscow in 1957, 1959, there was a heated impromptu exchange between two world leaders against the backdrop of a model kitchen. It was part of a model home designed by Raymond Lowy's firm, Lowy Smith, based on an example from Comac, Long Island. Split level house, nicknamed the Splitnik, and the home was said to cost $14,000 in 1959 money. It was meant to represent the kind of home that a typical American family could afford an idea that Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev attacked during what became known as the kitchen debate. If Soviet visitors to the fair were moderately impressed by the middle brow gadgets of the, the, the split in the kitchen, they were wowed by the aptly named Miracle Kitchen, which was a joint venture between Whirlpool and RCA. The Miracle Kitchen traveled across the US throughout 1957 and then went on display in Moscow in 1959. It was introduced to Soviet visitors at the American National Exhibition by a young woman named Ann Anderson, who was born in Illinois to Ukrainian parents and spoke enough Russian to communicate with the visitors at the fair. Photographer Robert Lerner 
took portraits of Anderson, demonstrating the devices and posing with appliances in the Miracle Kitchen for Look magazine, which ran a feature on it in 1959. Anderson looked as though she herself had been styled to coordinate with the kitchen's brightly colored four Michael panels. She wore a pale blue shirtwaist dress, bright red lipstick, a red manicure, strands of pearls, and a pair of black high heels. She was wearing the mid-century uniform of a woman who keeps house on her own, but also commands a small army of machines to lighten her workload. The kitchen had been designed as propaganda to intimidate Soviet visitors and to engender in them a feeling of being have-nots, even as their government maintained an edge in the early years of the space race. But the Miracle Kitchen was also a kind of appliance fantasia, more aspirational than realistic, even for wealthy Americans of the era. The freestanding range could theoretically bake a cake in three minutes using microwave technology. The dishwasher would slide on a track over to the dining table after meals for easy loading. Ann Anderson demonstrated the kitchen's push button planning center from which she could summon the dishwasher or the mini vacuum cleaner that looks a little bit like a proto Roomba. If all of this sounds too good to be true, it mostly was. According to an interview with one of the kitchen's designers, Joe Maxwell, who had worked on the Detroit-based firm Sunberg Ferrer, a two-way mirror had been installed in the kitchen display, allowing someone behind the scenes to move the robot vacuum cleaner and the dishwasher back and forth by radio control. Perhaps some Soviet visitors believed this display represented a typical, typical middle-class kitchen in the US, but the closest we came during this period was the kitchen miracle was Hollywood. Mid-century movies, TV shows, and cartoons are loaded with examples of Rube Goldberg-like futuristic kitchens that automated cooking and cleaning tasks, sometimes to an absurd degree. The Hanna-Barbera cartoon, The Jetsons, debuted on ABC in 1962, portraying a nuclear family living in mid 21st century Orbit City. The Jetson family, husband and wife, George and Jane, son and daughter, Elroy and Judy, lived as a typical 1960s family would have. Jane is a housewife. George works just a few hours per week, it's noted, for a company called Spacely Space Rockets. And the Jetsons have a robot maid named Rosie, who wore an old fashioned black and white maid's uniform and zipped around on a set of wheels. The Jetsons kitchen was like a futuristic version of the Horn and Hardart automat, where customs, customers could select meals and desserts from behind little glass doors. A device called the Food rack -a cycle offered tried and true dishes like Irish stew, beef stroganoff, prime rib, pizza, and fried chicken on demand. The food dispensers on the original Star Trek series, which debuted in, on NBC in 1966, functioned somewhat similarly to the Food rack -a cycle There's also a wonderful film called Glass Bottom Boat, which is a Doris Day romantic comedy, um, where Doris Day plays um, a PR woman, kind of a, a quote unquote career girl of that era, um, who visits her love interest in his very high tech bachelor pad kitchen. And all sorts of things happen automatically, very similar to what you would have seen in the Whirlpool Miracle Kitchen. Um, and at one point she exclaims, this kitchen doesn't even need a woman, um, kind of in horror. And it's a really interesting moment because it sort of suggests that um, the idea that not just her own convenience, but her very existence is being kind of programmed out of these um, very high tech spaces. Um, speaking of Hollywood, one, let's see, a fairy tale version of Jennifer Nelson's startling experience in Templeton's kitchen unfolds in the choreographed dance scenes and original music for, in Design for Dreaming, a 1956 industrial short film that was created to promote Frigidaire's Kitchen of the Future and Motorama. During this era, Frigidaire was owned by General Motors, which purchased the company in 1919. The car company incorporated kitchen displays in its annual auto show, which ran the first staged, which were first staged at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York in 1949 and ran every year until 1961. So this is about 10 minutes. The, the clip I'm gonna show you is only about 90 seconds, but the full extravaganza is on YouTube. So if you really like this sort of thing, you can tune in and I'll show you this clip. Just like a man, you give him a break And you round up in the kitchen baking a cake But this was a kitchen like none I've seen Put a card in the slot and onto the screen comes a picture of just how your dish will look Plus all the ingredients you need to cook 
There's no need for the bride to feel tragic. The rest is push-button magic. So whether you bake or broil or stew, the Frigidaire kitchen does it all for you. Don't have to be chained to the stove all day. Just set the timer and you're on your way. Tick, tock, tick, tock. I'm free to have fun around the clock. My cake is ready. Time for the show. Everybody on stage. So another interesting illustration of women sort of being allowed to do fun things like playing tennis or playing golf in a very cool golf uniform, um, because all of these machines are able to do these kind of impossible tasks, right? Things that they can't even do now. Um, the Kitchen of Tomorrow was one of the highlights of a short-lived but high-profile episode in Frigidaire's history, not just because of the kitchen itself was such a big hit, but because in the mid-1950s, General Motors hired a group of women they nicknamed the Damsels of Design. Harley J. Earl, at the time the vice president of the company's styling section, began discreetly hiring these female industrial designers in the 1940s because he believed they could better, they could help GM better understand women's preferences, namely how they shopped and made major purchasing decisions. Earl recruited most of the damsels from the Proud Institute in New York, and GM publicized the hires widely. Dozens of color photographs show the women posing and posing with clay models of concept cars in progress or showing off the features of new models. Six of the women, Ruth Glennie, Jeanette Linder, Sandra Longyear, Marjorie Ford Pullman, Peggy Sauer, and Suzanne Vanderbilt were assigned to the automotive interior design department on aspects of decor with the exception of the dashboard. The other four, Dagmar Arnold, Jerry Cavanaugh, Jan Krebs, and Jan Van Alstein worked at Frigidaire where they were part of the team that designed the Kitchen of Tomorrow. Earl organized an event called the Feminine Auto Show <laughs> in GM, GM Styling Dome in 1958 to show off their innovations, which included things like makeup mirrors, storage consoles, childproof locks, and retractable seat belts. And the Kitchen of Tomorrow has a lot in common with the office of today, you might say. Um, there is a lot of automation. There is this sort of idea that you can put a punch card, kind of an IBM style punch card in a computer, and it'll show you um, an image of what your, your food is gonna look like. In a sense, we have that now because we, a lot of us cook with our iPhones and sort of you know, Google recipes and uh, watch YouTube videos to try to learn how to do things. But, um, and this was a slightly updated version of it, which had a very cool hexagonal grill. So the marketing really centered around the idea that you were sort of leaping ahead in time. You could have access to the kitchen of tomorrow today um, and it would be sort of maybe less angular, less pink, uh, but still ex extremely cool. And Westinghouse, um, which is an appliance company, focused on um, all the cool things that could happen by having your home be completely um, electronic, which is also something that resonates uh, for in today's electronic surveilled world. This is called Total Electric Home, and this is just a short clip. Cooking is really a joy in the food preparation center. Here you have a refrigerator that looks like fine furniture. For convenience, the upper unit of the refrigerator opens from both sides, and below are handy, spacious refrigerator and freezer drawers. Then, too, there's the miraculous electronic oven that will cook these appetizers in six seconds. Appetizers that were prepared from recipes kept in this microfilm file. Thousands of recipes are on file here, and simply by pressing a couple of buttons, the recipe of your choice appears on the screen. So 
so I, I, the idea of having a microfilm in the kitchen is, is so hilariously inefficient, but um, again, that was, you know, would have been a huge leap forward. And this video, the entire thing is actually really cool. It kind of goes through every aspect of your house that can be sort of electrified. Um, and of course, the other big innovation, apart from its use in Tupperware, was plastic. Um, this is the Monsanto House of the Future at Disneyland, which was developed uh, by engineers at MIT and uh, designed or promoted by the Monsanto company to sort of promote everything um, that could be achieved with the use of plastic, which was kind of injection molding and kind of unusual shapes and um, just lots and lots of evident glamour. Um, so then there's the question of food. And, you know, not everybody likes to cook, some people do. Um, but these kitchens that have lots of technological gadgets and sort of things that do tasks for you, um, presuppose that you're the kind of person who would have bought one of these books that were actually very popular in the day. Um, they don't suggest that you're this kind of person, right, who has a very old school pegboard with all your well-used tools and like to do things the old fashioned way and kind of discover great ingredients and aren't too worried about um, high tech. So that brings me to the question of really what happened to the kitchen of the future. And I think that this moment in the late sixties is kind of where the kitchen of tomorrow reaches, reaches its decadent phase. Like it's kind of at the end of its life as a Republic and kind of uh, sort of entering <laughs> a, a new era. Um, there was a ton of space race imagery that was used in um, a lot of advertising for these things. And it's in a way, it's hilarious and they're, and they're kind of fabulous graphically. Um, but it also, I think, demonstrates in a way the fact that all of that futurism was starting to feel a little bit irrelevant. Um, there is this real emphasis starting in the late 60s and early 70s on customization and how you can kind of have these artistic, um, you know, one of a kind um, refrigerator doors. And uh, there's a great video called Match Your Mood. Um, which is on YouTube also from Westinghouse, which demonstrates, you know, all sort of six different styles of how you can do this. Um, and it's, you know, it tethers together with this gender question of a lot of these ads in this era are echoing that kind of 1930s, um, more wife and less housewife, the idea that you will be a more attractive spouse as a woman. And from your husband's point of view, you will be a more attractive spouse um, if you have these, these, you know, brand new devices. Um, but that was also kind of flipped on its head, right? There were women who were sort of like, I, you know, I don't want to spend all my time doing this and this is going to help me do other things. And that's awesome. Um, the absurd version of this, I think, is emblematized by the Honeywell Kitchen Computer, which is an amazing, basically calculator. Um, it was a computer. Um, featured in the Neiman Marcus Christmas catalog as a kind of um, completely over the top like incredible gift. I think it retailed for something like $10,000 and this was in 1969. And the kitchen computer would theoretically do a lot of the things that the computers depicted in those sort of Futurama videos would do for you. And it was essentially kind of like help you make a grocery list, um, you know, tabulate your, uh, the cost of your groceries, do the math, you know, not really something that you need a gigantic uh, sort of appliance sized computer in the middle of your kitchen, but look at how it's styled, right? It's covered with um, this, you know, baskets of vegetables and the, the, the housewife in question is wearing this kind of um, beautiful, almost like applique sort of hippie dress. Um, and that sort of connects in my mind to this ad for Pyrex from 1969, which was the year of the moon landing that the idea of a woman reading this magazine in 1969 and kind of being told that the next horizon was like a new brand of Pyrex, it's sort of like, well, the, ne the next horizon is the moon. Like I, I, can, I can read and write and you know, see what's going on in the world. So I think that what happened to the kitchen of the future is that the, the tethering of women to that space started to fray during the women's movement. And the idea of over the top theatrical appliances that would kind of do these lavish, uh, you know, kind of over the top cooking chores for you became less appealing. And what became more appealing um, was simply low maintenance. And that sort of makes some sense when you start to look at kitchens in the seventies and eighties, um, not over the top, pretty subtle, Lots of like almond color, cream, brown, you know, sort of relatively low key. Um, the microwave becomes a huge convenience. And in general, 
um, this idea of kind of thinking about the kitchen of the future fades as a trend. Um, and if anything, where we are today in 2020, um, there's this sort of glamour of the craftsmanship of kind of thinking back to the kitchen of the past. So with that, um, I am happy to take some questions and go back to any slide that anybody would like. And I think I'll, should I unshare my screen? No, you, um, you can <laughs> share your screen. Leave it up. There we go. Hello. Um, yes, if you have any questions, please pop them into the Q&A. Um, and that, that's just an amazing amount of research that you've done, Sarah. Wow. I mean, mind blowing. <laughs> and kind of, I mean, such a strange episode in our history. <laughs> if you think about it, like it's just, I mean, the it, it captures a lot of um, recognizable impulses, but I mean, the, the extent to which um, these companies and advertisers really invested in this kind of mythos of gender and futuristic kitchens was, it was intense. Um, and it, it, it isn't like that now. I think convenience is certainly really important the way it's advertised, but um, the diversity of gender and all sorts of other things in advertising has, has expanded quite a lot. But it's interesting how um, the kitchen still today is sort of a status symbol, right? You can Definitely. spend oh, that, a lot. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and counterintuitively, I mean, I think in a way, if you think back to like the plain English kitchens that I showed at the very beginning that are all kind of painted wood, those cost a fortune. They, they cost more than a normal person's house, like at least. Um, you know, and they're they're not sort of dazzling in the way that something kind of theatrical, like a you know a moving dishwasher, will kind of blow you away. They're not um, kind of sideshow. They're they're sort of very deliberately subtle, um, but they are a real major status symbol. I'd say more so than a kitchen that looks very high tech nowadays. Thank you. Okay, so Pamela. Arcuri is asking, please give the names again of the videos to look up on YouTube for the full content. Oh, yes. So that is, there's Design for Dreaming, which is the kitchen of the future, the, the golf dance Fantasia. There is um, the Middletons at the Fair, which is the 1939 like boxing match uh, dishwasher competition. Um, and there is, the last one was ele Total Electric Home. By Westinghouse. So if you if you just Google those or search those in YouTube, you'll find them. And then there's another one which I didn't include just because we're kind of short on time, called Match Your Mood, um, also by Westinghouse. So if you if you search that, that's the one that has um, kind of late sixties, early seventies like style ideas for your your customized fridge. So I highly recommend all of this. Um, so James Wilson is asking or making a comment, every episode of HGTV features the desirability of kitchen islands. When did these begin to become common features in kitchens? Hmm, Do you know? That's a really good question. I think I have not seen a lot of evidence for kitchen islands in the kind of 1920s, 30s era. My sense is that it became common in the post-war boom when suburban houses were being built so that they were kind of a feature of like the Levittown house or you know Lustron houses. Um, they were kind of um, a, a suburban innovation because you had more space to play with. Um, it's, it's tricky to do that in a, in a city kitchen, right? Because you just don't have the square footage. But um, that is actually a really good question though. I'm not 100% sure whether it was like 50s, 60s. So I would have to drill down into that and, and, and research the islands. <laughs> Okay. Can you talk about the trend towards open kitchen plans? Mm -hmm. That's a huge one. That's like, and the interesting thing about that is that it also cuts across um, class. Like it's something that, you know, you have that in a studio apartment and you'll have that in, I think um, the last time I gave a talk about this topic, I had a photo from uh, Kim Kardashian's kitchen, which is also like hugely open plan and, and enormous. But the same concept applies, which is um, that people kind of live in their kitchens and that there's, you know, the sort of fine furniture and comfortable places to hang out um, open that opens onto the rest of the house. And that started to be really popular in the early to mid 60s. Um, before that, I think there was a, 
a, a worry about smells and kind of trying to contain smells, but as ventilation started to improve, um, it was easier to kind of keep smells a little bit lingering, you know, in the kitchen space and kind of have a more open plan design, which was hugely popular because that's, as you know, everybody who has, a, back when we could have parties before the pandemic, um, every time you have people over, people kind of congregate there. They want to know what's going on. They, they want to see what's happening. They want to help. Um, so having that be collapsed and open um, is, you know, is, I think, as desirable now as it was 50 years ago. Yeah, interesting too that maybe 10, 15 years ago, the idea of having a place to have a laptop or an iPad mm -hmm. um, for cooking or, and, and now many people are working out of their kitchens, right? <laughs> so, <Exactly>. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how did dining rooms relate to the futuristic kitchens? This is Bilkis Ansari asking mm -hmm. that. that. You know, I don't, have a strong sense that they did actually. I think the kitchen of the future was really designed, was a marketing scheme, it, not in a nefarious way, but just a marketing scheme to sell appliances and to sell cabinets and to sell plumbing fixtures and all that stuff. And the dining room is really kind of its own thing. Like you're, you're buying furniture for it, but you're not really necessarily buying kind of a suite of machines for your dining room. So I think the idea of having, um, that's one reason why the kitchen is so appealing to marketers because there's a lot in there that you can sell to people, right? And sort of themed around the same activity. Um, so I, I don't have a strong sense that they were really closely connected other than, uh, you know, potentially maybe being, you know, some sort of overlap in the population that liked modern furniture, for instance, that would be, you know, interested in buying like Herman Miller chairs and dining tables or what have you. That's great. Um, thank you. Um, pa Patricia Mueller is asking, did Frederick Taylor write a paper or a book about his research at Bethlehem Steel? Ooh, that's a good question. I think my understanding is that it was a book, but that, don't quote me on that. It may have been an article. I think that he's been written about very, very extensively. Like a lot of people have researched his papers and his writings and or his, his practices. Um, he wasn't really a public facing figure in his day. Like he's become better known in certain ways um, uh, as his influence has been studied. Um, I know that there's a good biography of him out there somewhere, but yeah, I would have to double check on that. Okay, um, thank you. Um, These are really interesting questions. I know. <laughs> um, <Wow. laughs> so, Julia Zimmerman says, I'm in an alternate reality today. I work and my husband does the cooking and yet I decide what the kitchen looks like. So where does the future kitchen stand? That is, I think that's actually really common. Like my, my husband does most of the cooking in our household and like we would both work, but like he's, he's really like the, the foodie. Um, that's, what's interesting about that is that it highlights the fact that the labor is distinct from the decor, right? Like you can have a kitchen that looks very high tech and or very luxurious or very whatever, but that's almost separate from the question of how you use it, who uses it, how often. Um, there's a lot of fancy kitchens in the world that really don't get used, right? That are kind of trophy showcases mm -hmm. from fancy houses that are just kind of like, you know, the center of a lot of takeout or catering or, or whatever. Um, so I think your situation is probably pretty common um, at least I, I share it personally. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to keep up with all these questions. This is fantastic. Um, uh, let's see. This uh, Sarah Klugej is asking, this is wonderful, thank you. I see a lot of thin petite white women in these kitchen advertisements. Could you say something about how they racialize kitchen workers? Oh, that's really interesting. They, I mean, the advertising, uh, landscape is extremely, extremely white and petite, um, as was advertising for cosmetics, um, you know, actresses on TV. I mean, that was really it. The world was blanketed in, in white women um, in, in a certain way, uh, media wise, and they were perceived as the consumers, again, because we touched briefly on redlining and the fact that African Americans were largely locked out of home ownership in a lot of places in the United States, most places. Um, so if you're locked out of home ownership, you're not looking for a dishwasher, right? So the, the consumer base is very white middle class. Um, 
And that does not start to change until like at the earliest, the 1970s. That's when you start getting actually um, more African-Americans in cosmetic ads and fashion, um, more African-Americans in advertising for um, home goods, appliances, but still not the majority, still definitely um, the minority. Thank you. Um, Valerie Adon Adonizio, do any of these fantasy kitchens survive? Ooh, that's really interesting. I, the, the images that I have are, at least for the kitchen of the future, are from uh, General Motors archives. I don't think that they survive. I think the components survive. Like I think the elements, like the sort of panels and different uh, aspects. Julia Child's kitchen actually is in the Smithsonian, interestingly. Um, but as, when I was researching this book, I could not find an extant example like on display of say the Whirlpool kitchen. I think like, I, I hope that the elements survive some, you know, in a, a museum somewhere in Milwaukee or something. Um, but yeah, I think they're, they're largely, you know, they're, he they're heavily documented. Um, ho hopefully they exist somewhere. That's great. Um, thank you. Um, Arlene Rubin is asking, can you comment about Formica and the Chrome dining set? Ooh. Oh, the four, yeah, the, like the tables and chairs. The, yeah, Formica, we didn't talk a lot about Formica here, but that's, it was huge and remains huge, actually. Um, another post-war innovation. And those dinette sets were wildly popular, and they're actually collectible now. Um, so they would have things like all of those sort of atomic um, shapes, like the boomerang um, or sort of swirls. There were... Um, I actually have a Formica, like a binder from Formica that has samples of like all these different patterns that you could choose from. And they would typically have like um, sort of pleather seats in a coordinating color and then chrome around the edges. So they almost look like a diner. Like it almost looks like there's kind of a kitchen set mm. that you're kind of, your kitchen is part of a diner. Um, and those, you know, they were affordable materials. So it was a way for people to buy a brand new dinette set for the kitchen that was not especially costly and was very much of the moment, like having sort of in co fancy colors like pink or pale blue that were very, uh, you know, chic in the 1950s. Thank you. Um, Ian Petrie uh, is asking, was the kitchen of the future undermined by the way in which cooking, baking, even especially in the time intensive ways became a bourgeois hobby as opposed to an obligation in the way that other domestic domestic tasks didn't that's i think that's definitely the case it's that's a very likely outcome because essentially the kitchen of the future supposes it they had to strike this weird balance where advertisers needed to affirm that women belonged in the kitchen and therefore needed something to do what while they were there belonging um, but they also needed to be sold and upsold on all these gadgets. So they had to kind of do enough things to sort of make you feel like, oh, my, my burden is lifted and my, my youthful beauty will not fade. Um, but also that there's still kind of a reason for you to be in charge of this stuff, right? Like you're the person who knows how to cook. You're the person who knows how to set a table and all this kind of stuff. So I think the idea that cooking became... Um, uh, kind of something that men and women equally really like to kind of geek out on, like the sort of foodie culture that begins with like James Beard and Julia Child, people sort of exploring different kinds of cheeses and ingredients and getting into recipes. And um, you don't, you know, particularly want a machine to take over for it for that. Um, so absolutely, I think that that definitely was a, a sort of fork in the road for the kitchen of tomorrow, the kitchen of yesterday. <laughs> So Rebecca McGee Tuck um, says, "Thank you so much. That was great. A great presentation. What does your kitchen look like?" That's a great and, idea. <laughs> and do you think that the new interest in blue apron type products are an example of the idea that we are no longer looking for convenience only, and now are returning to the old English kitchen style, where the kitchen is a gathering place and less of a workplace? Hmm, that's, yeah, definitely. So my kitchen is mostly Ikea. We have um, pretty cool um, sort of like slate blue cabinets uh, that we quite like. And we have, um, I think we have Frigidaire appliances actually. So some things never change. Um, 
yeah, and in kind of a rolling cart for our KitchenAid mixer and that kind of stuff. So it, it works pretty well. We don't have as much counter space as we would like, but it's sort of a, a work in progress. We'll probably evolve the design. Um, and what was the, the second part was uh, Blue Apron, like kits and stuff. The, yeah, what do you think the interest in Blue Apron products, like what are the examples that we're no longer looking for convenience only and now are returning to the fresh sort of food prep? Yeah. Yes. Well, I think the, the freshness thing is, you know, the whole, it's basically the question of sort of like, what do you do when you can't shop or when you shop for produce and then it all spoils by the time you get to deal with it. And it's kind of, especially for people with young kids where both parents work, it's sort of wrangling produce is, is a big thing. And I guess the kits offer people um, a way to parcel out things like freeze them and defrost them and sort of make different kinds of things. So there's variety. So it's not everything from a can. Um, we actually went through a phase at home where we were doing blue apron and then stopped because we sort of like, you know, it, it sort of had its run and we decided to just move on to other stuff. But I think the kits speak to a desire for real food and a desire to kind of get away from, from products and, and, you know, food, food like substances <laughs> that kind of are not super good for us. And, um, and last on the shelves for, for decades. Okay, just a few more questions. Um, I, I think you talked about this already, but Dominique Ellis asked this question twice in the chat and then <laughs> and it says, in your research, hi Dominique, I don't wanna leave you out. In your research in the topic of redlining, was there any advertisements that were geared towards non-white audiences and in what ways were they advertised? When did kitchen advertising start to be aimed at a larger and more diverse demographic? Yeah, we did touch on this a little bit, but basically the short answer is no. Like I, I didn't see anything representing or aimed at um, anybody non-white until at the earliest, like the mid seventies. Um, that's, you know, and there, there may be examples that were earlier that I just haven't seen, um, but yeah, that was, it was pretty late. Okay. And the other question from Dominique, she says, thank you, Sarah. Always, I always learn more. I'm interested to think about how the pandemic is inviting a return to domesticity on a national and global scale. Definitely. As we are in a moment where mid-century mid modern is in fashion again, what would you predict would be the kitchen of the future or streamlined version? Like what would the streamlined version be? Yeah, I actually think about this a lot because I, I noticed that mid-century kitchen style is really niche. Like there are people who like it and there are people who do, you know, I follow the hashtag on Instagram and see the people doing these kind of atomic ranch renovations. There is a population that likes it, but it's not most people. It's much, what, what's more popular I would say is a kind of farmhouse look or, uh, you know, kind of a pared down sort of clean, uh, you know, modern look that's not atomic age, like not wacky, but kind of, uh, you know, sort of simple. Um, because I think especially now we're home all the time. So that's causing all of us to kind of like micro critique every aspect of our interiors because we're inside all day. <laughs> and we're also cooking more, I think, you know, it's, there's, um, I personally have been a little like skittish about takeout with, you know, I've been like wanting to support businesses, but also kind of like, oh, is it safe? Um, you know, and sort of making your own stuff with groceries um, is no fail, right? You're, you know, you're not taking risk there. And I've also been one of the people who's gotten into sourdough, so that's been very entertaining. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think the pandemic definitely has domesticated us anew, in a sense. Like that's, you know, it's it's really um, like a, a like a rainy day that has lasted for ten months. Like we're all indoors, you know. Like what are we gonna do? <laughs> right. So I'm gonna combine two questions. Um, Susan Bandy's says you include a picture on page 120 of a wall hung pink refrigerator freezer. I'm wondering how unusual or common this was and for how long it was a thing. Mm. And then Arlene Rubin is saying, can you comment on the changing colors of the kitchen, i.e. pink on the dinette sets, yellow on the walls? Yeah, so the wall hung, that like amazing like hanging freezer, very unusual. That was like almost certainly designed for, uh, you know, the, the the ad or, you know, designed to be kind of a, a prototype or, you know, that was extremely unusual for people to have in their houses, but colorful kitchens were very common. And that was partly because um, this bizarre connection that exists between the auto industry and kitchens, like the fact that GM owns Frigidaire and you would have kitchens at Motorama and that there was um, actually a parallel between the colors of the cars and the colors of the kitchen sets. So an appliance might be pink 
the same year that you know a model car was pink and then the next year pale yellow and the next year pale blue. Um, and that's known in the, the trade as annual styling. And it's something that actually originated in the auto industry. The idea that you could kind of sell someone a thing they don't need, like a new iPhone, for instance, because it's a new car or a new, it has a new gadget or a new something um, as a way to accelerate. Um, it's not exactly planned obsolescence because it's not the idea that it falls apart prematurely. It's more the idea that you just like have to have it because it's cool. Um, so the color thing, has the sort of unintended side effect of being able to identify when a house was last renovated, which is a fun thing to, to note if you're looking at houses like in South Philly where I live, there's a lot of avocado green, <laughs> you know, a lot of like harvest gold and, and all that stuff. That's great. Um, so uh, Mickey Shirley says our 1961 home has a Frigidaire flare. So yes, some oh. of the kitchens of the future elements do survive. I'm so jealous. <laughs> um, um, Julia Zimmerman uh, comments, I find it fascinating that Julia Child's kitchen is like an industrial workshop. Hey, I know. And then, we'll and then Jill Popko says, no question, just thanks for a terrific overview. Glad glass is back and plastic disposable is ending. Yeah. And then Matthew Bird, um, thank you for looking it up. Taylor published a book called Principles of Scientific oh. Management and it's available online. There you go. Good old, um, good old uh, FT. Thank you. Yes. Um, wow, that was great. Lots to think about in our domestic spaces. It's, it's yes, timely it that we're all trapped inside. <laughs> yes. Oh, hold on. There's something, something else. Victoria Montraga says ads targeted for Black families appeared in magazines published for that market. Johnson Publishing, Ebony and Jet magazines, for example ad magazines run by blacks and black models and photographers created the ads. There's an example of the Frankfurt kitchen. There's an example of this in, of the Frankfurt kitchen in a museum in Europe. Yes, there is, there is an extant Frankfurt kitchen. It was also on display at MoMA. And that's a really interesting point about um, the Johnson uh, family um, because there was, there's a wonderful retro kitchen that was designed for them in Chicago, which I believe is being preserved. Um, and the name of the architect who actually was white is, has evaporated from my brain, but, um, I can all tweet about this because I, it's really interesting. It was a kind of fabulous, like mustard yellow, orange, green kitchen. Um, and it was the same guy who did their offices, like the Ebony corporate offices, which were also sort of ultra glam. So that's a really good point that basically the marketing was segregated, le like life itself. Well, what's interesting about that Frankfurt kitchen, it's very, it's very much what you find in apartments in Europe. Like if you Airbnb right. or something like the kitchens are, are very much still in, in that mode or they have the washing machine in the kitchen, right? The clothes, it's, the laundry. It's, but it's that kind of chic, like geometric, colorful. Yeah. 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 It's amazing. Well, um, you've got so many thank yous. Um, and accolades in the chats from everyone, um, thanking you, finding it fascinating. Um, I think I've gotten all the questions and if I missed you, I'm really sorry. Um, you can always uh, find me on, on the interwebs, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah, and, and also um, some good questions about um, if this presentation will be available and yes, it will be on the Peters Valley YouTube channel. So someone wanted to share it with some chefs. Cool. <laughs> and, yeah, definitely. And, and then let's see, lastly, Shirley Wajda says, great presentation. Thanks so much. My father sold Youngstown kitchens in the 1950s and 60s. And I have his sales kits and miniature oh, dishwasher. Oh Fascinating moment in the history of American domesticity. Wow gender and technology so maybe the two of you need to connect <laughs> yeah oh my god that's amazing that's yeah I love. Really? I, I, she likes miniatures <laughs> exactly I love, i'm obsessed with miniatures so that this is definitely like yeah uh, wait wait at my alley <laughs> um yeah and then oh gosh one last question um this is fascinating aside from the installation of water and gas what was the second thing that caused the shift to the creation of the kitchen as a separate room that's the last one I'll ask. Oh, right. So that's, yeah. So it's, it's, it's appliances and gas and water. Um, and it's also essentially 
the growth of the population that neither had help nor was help. That there was sort of, we, the middle class as we know it today, that even though we complain about it being hollowed out all the time because it is, still is, is vast. And it didn't used to be that way. It used to be sort of that most people were very poor and there was a small population of the very rich and then a kind of smaller, um, what I call like the Ebenezer Scrooge class that was kind of the, the business people who were sort of right below that. And the kitchens for um, the idea that you would have a kind of glamorous or nicely designed kitchen for yourself um, that was not your workspace where you kind of went to work for somebody else's household um, was, was new because the social, um, the distribution of those economic classes changed after sort of basically after World War I, but kind of steadily from the Industrial Revolution onward. Fascinating. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, all of you who tuned in tonight. Thank you, Sarah. And um, so we'll, we'll be tuned in. And yeah. we're going to have to tune into yeah. your cat book, your cat land. A different, a totally different topic. Yes. I uh, know. <laughs> Fascinating <laughs> research. <laughs> that <you did. laughs> but a well, good, good luck. For cat people. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It was so fun. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rachel. Bye.